Hello and welcome to the Polygraph on the Print. Uh, today I have with me the political editor of the print, DK Singh from Delhi, and I'm Sharan Kohara, the associate editor from Bangalore. And today we take upon a very important question that's been sort of nagging in Karnataka, which is whether the caste conundrum will affect the BJP's prospects in the upcoming assembly elections. So how do these caste equations help the BJP or go against them? Caste is an important factor in Karnataka's society as well as its politics. And uh, how this turns out, and how the equations actually go in favor or against the BJP is something that we'll have to see. But for starters, this is the question that we try to answer today on whether this caste conundrum will help the BJP or not. Uh, so DK Singh, what do you think will actually... Does, uh, how... Shadar, uh, okay. Uh, so before coming to that question, uh, I'll take one question straight from our viewers. Uh, the question is, do you think caste politics can work in a state like Karnataka, where a large number of people live in urban areas? And if you can answer that question, you are there. <laughs> well, Karnataka, I mean, of course, everyone's looking at Bangalore as the most, uh, you know, populous city. Yes, but uh, Bangalore also is known as a city of Wakaligas, which is another caste group that's dominant in Bangalore. Yes, it does impact about 28 seats, but then a larger part of Karnataka and the deciding factor may not only rely on, uh, you know, be based in Karnataka, uh, in Bangalore. So yes, uh, yes, there are places that will have uh, an impact with the caste, uh, entire caste politics. It does have a la lot to, you know, play in Bangalore as well. Uh, Bangalore has just 1.2 to 3 crores of the entire 7 crore odd population of Karnataka. So about a good nearly 198 seats, 96 seats are still outside of Bangalore. So yes, it will still play a very important role. And even ticket uh, distribution by the Congress, BJP and JDS, of course, will have a caste factor in them. And no matter how urban the city is, uh, how, how urban these centers are, caste does still play an important role here. Now, coming to the main question, when we talk about uh, how this caste politics will impact the BJP in Karnataka, we can see very safely, see elections are still four months away. And BJP is trying, trying out different things, juggling a reservation quota recently. Uh, we saw what happened. And we'll talk about it in detail uh, a bit later. High Court has already uh, put a stay on that, uh, on the cabinet decision. So, Sharon, we'll talk about it. My question here is why I find the BJP caught up in a twister kind of a situation is evident from uh, the way the leaders are talking. So you had this investor summit in Bangalore just uh, last November. Mm -hmm. Minister, there is the summit where he was talking about, you know, how when you talk about talent and technology, uh, you know, what comes to your mind is Brand Bangalore. Brand Bangalore is a big deal. Yeah. So it's supposed to be your tech and the startup capital. And then two months later, Amit Shah goes to Bangalore. He's addressing his party workers. And he's talking about, you know, in, in this election, people have to choose between Prime Minister Modi, who built a temple in Ayodhya and developed Kashi, uh, Kashi and, uh, you know, Badrinath, and those who uh, glorify Tipu Sultan. Now, obviously, that, that tells you that BJP finds itself in a kind of a, in a twister kind of a situation where it's not even showcasing the works done by its own government. You would expect the BJP to talk about governance what the Bombay government has achieved. Great. That tells you there are jitters in the BJP camp. Also because of the way Baswara is Bombay has managed things. And we'll come to that question later. Coming to this caste politics, if, uh, Sharan, if you can tell us a bit about the recent thing on reservation. What did the government do on reservation? Did they try to juggle the different categories? So, uh, Sharon, if you can tell us the different categories of uh, reservation in uh, uh, Bangalore, in Karnataka. Uh, have, so, as it is, after this cabinet decision, the overall uh, you know, reservation quota went up to 56%. Correct. Over the Supreme Court ceiling, but then we are talking about EWS also. We'll come to, again, we'll address the EWS question. But if you can explain to us, you have, what we are told that 95% of Karnataka population come under one, reservation, one or the other reservation category. Only 5% people are left. So 
what are the agitations about? And today also, uh, we were discussing earlier how our Pancham Shalis have uh, laid a siege uh, at the chief minister's place. Okay. So, yeah, like you were saying that, you know, the Panchamasalis uh, are the one of the biggest subsects within the Lingayats. They had demanded that they be included in the 2A category, which comes under category 2A of the backward classes list, uh, who get about 15% reservations. Now, this is a very big, you know, the biggest chunk of reservations within the OBCs. And they wanted to be included for that because they thought that they will get better reservations for their community members and so on. But the government, uh, the Basuraj my government, uh, actually went ahead and tried to find a solution outside of this uh, by trying to placate them as well as not upsetting the other girls in community. So they came up, they carved out two new categories within the category two, which is 2C and 2D. And this is for the Vokaliga community as well as the Lingayat community. Now, these are two very dominant communities in Karnataka. And most of our chief ministers so far uh, have been either from these two castes, except for barring maybe about six of them. Everyone has been from these two communities. So they wield a significant amount of political clout. Now, what has happened is the Panchamasali community actually rejected this idea. They said that there was too much confusion because the Basurat Bomai government had proposed that they will take out the additional, the remaining part from the EWS and then give it share it between the 2C and 2D categories under which Panchamsalis and Vokali has come. Of course, there's a lot of ambiguity in it. There is no clarity at all. And the Panchamsalis rejected it. And yesterday, the High Court also rejected this. They have put a stay on this particular proposal. And today, the Panchamsalis have, you know, they were on their way to Shiggaon, which is Basuraj Bhumai's constituency, and holding him personally responsible for uh, not, you know, keeping up to his promises. So caste is important and under the various categories, Lingai, like it's believed in that in Karnataka, the Lingayats back the BJP at least since 2008. And then the Vokaligas have sort of consolidated behind uh, HD, HD Devegaoda led JDS. And then the Congress depends on the votes of minorities, backward classes and others. But now we see that, you know, this entire Panchabasali thing going against the BJP itself. Now, this is a core supporter base. And mind you, Panchabasali is a very, very big community and also have people who are chief ministers in waiting. Since you mentioned the global investors meet, uh, the industries minister is from the Panchabasali community. And his name was also doing the rounds when Yadurapa was forced to step down. So this community does have, you know, has its intention of keeping its members first. And, uh, you know, the BJP government under Bombay has not delivered on any of these promises. So caste here is something that they have to be very carefully with, carefully doing. And Amit Shah, when he came down to Karnataka, he was seen with, uh, seen in the Adi Chunchungiri Mutt where he's trying to appeal towards, uh, you know, Absolutely. the vocal the vocal and this is in Mandya. So if BJP thinks that it can get a, whole, a complete majority, a full majority on its own, then uh, it requires the support of all communities and cannot rely solely on Lingayats or, you know, any other particular community. So they need support from everyone and hence have been reaching out to everybody. But so far, all these efforts have not yielded to much obviously because the Panchamasalis and of course there are various other communities also demanding this. There are smaller communities also rejecting the idea that the Panchamasalis should be accommodated in the category 2A where there are 106 main, main castes, castes and caste groupings. So this leads to a very cluttered and complex problem for Bombay to solve. And so far his solution has been completely rejected by the one group he thought will completely accept his solution. So the BJP has a very difficult, you know, a uh, few months ahead of the election. It has to manage expectations from various communities. And if it's seen to side one, then obviously the others, other communities will, you know, move away from this, uh, you know, from backing the BJP. So it is a very complex and a very fragile situation for the BJP right now under the caste, uh, you know, the caste uh, equations. Yeah. But this government is trying to please everybody, and that's why it's, it seems to be caught in a bind because it's not working out. People are not really happy with that. Yeah. Coming and to <laughs> Basavar Bombay Asharan, just tell me something. Prime Minister is talking about brand Bangalore. It's a tech and startup capital of India. 
Yes. But what you hear about Bangalore is, you know, what you see in the headlines, you know, metro pillar collapsing, killing people, you have sinkholes, you have roads caving in, you have water logging, you have flooding. Nothing seems to be working there. Correct. What has gone wrong? Is Basara and Bombay a liability for the BJP today? Yes, Basuraj Bombay has been an experiment that the BJP, I, I wish, you know, probably was, is, is probably rethinking because Bombay has not really been of, you know, any great value to the BJP. And he was the most plausible candidate after, you know, Yadurapa, perhaps he was acceptable to both the central leadership as well as Yadurapa. Uh, but like you said, Brand Bangalore has taken a very bad beating. This is not new, of course, but then in recent times, the problem has just, you know, really intensified. Uh, in fact, just yesterday, the Supreme Court has, you know, used Bangalore in a context of urban ruin, you know, of all things that's gone wrong with urban governance. Uh, when it was listening to, a, you know, a hearing a, a case related to Chandigarh, saying that, you know, do not become, do not make a Bangalore out of Chandigarh as well. Uh, so Bangalore barely has any roads. The chief minister continues to promise great development for the city. Thousands and thousands of crores is poured into the city to just fix potholes, mind you, not to make new roads. We're not talking about new roads. We're fixing the same problems that have been existent for the last 15, 20 years. Money is going, but nothing is coming back. And the recent floods, of course. Uh, though the rains were unprecedented, but the Un, the unplanned and rapid development that Bangalore has, you know, sort of Bangalore has seen could not contain any of these problems. Most people were homeless. Most people were left on the roads. And mind you, this is not just shanties we're talking about. We're talking about premium villas where startup founders and everybody else lived. These places were also flooded. So brand Bangalore worldwide has taken a very bad hit. And then you move to Bombay and Bombay's Bombay has not been able to live to any of his promises. So far, he has come up with just probably one or two schemes, and most of which is an extension of the schemes that were done earlier. One is where he he offered scholarships to the student uh, to the children of farmers, and uh, I can't even remember anything else that he has done. So there isn't much that Bombay has been able to do. What he inherited most of the problems that the BJP had under Yadurappa. But Yadurapa had a certain cloud where people at least wouldn't, you know, talk, uh, you know, wouldn't talk straight to his face or make complaints straight to his face, even though they may have their grouse. But with Bombay, they don't. He doesn't even enjoy the respect of his peers. Uh, for starters, because he's not from the core BJP, he's he's an outsider for all for all practical purposes. He's they been in the party. Yes, he came from the JDS. He's been in the party for just about 14 years and he's climbed. He's had a rapid ascent, of course. But this has also rubbed people on the wrong side. Now, you see there are several senior leaders who were completely left out. There are, cabinet, there are, there are people who could have been ministers but who aren't being made ministers. There are five vacancies within the cabinet, actually six, I think, now. And he has, he has made nothing short of about 20 to 30 trips. To Delhi, but he has still not got any approval to sort of, you know, some placation, placating some people would at least bring down the infighting. But so far, none of which has happened. And all of this has led to a place where the Congress is slowly gaining traction. JDS, everyone have gathered enough ammunition to attack the Bombay government. And the Bombay government has not been able to hit back because, for starters, it has nothing. I mean, you spoke about Amit Shah talking about whether they should vote between you know, the people who built the Ram Temple or who, those who glorified the glorified Tipu. In addition, the BJP state president, Nalin Kumar Kati, said, don't talk about potholes on roads, but let's discuss love jihad. Yeah. So that's sort of, you know, the communal angle that they want to take, which is nothing but a deflection from actual problems. Uh, these are all going to sort of weigh in on how voters actually look at this election and what you know what they expect. And the Bhavmai government has done you know basically nothing to address any of these. Uh, there are big statements about how he wants to develop Bangalore. We haven't seen any. I don't know which Bangalore he's trying to develop. There hasn't been any. He's talking about jobs. Yes, the global investors meet. We saw lakhs and crores of signings, but will they materialize? We don't know. And under him, we don't know. In fact, the metro incident that you mentioned, in the last about a year's time, 
he has changed the deadline of the metro and brought it closer. He said by December 2023 and 2024, some of these phases will be complete. Now, the metro's progress is very slow. And, it, you know, there were allegations that the 40% corruption is also leading to poor quality of works, which could have led to the metro pillar collapsing or the supporting pillar collapsing. So all of this is adding up. And then you have contractors who, for the first time, have come out in the open and said that that the government elected representatives and officials are demanding as much as 40% commission. They have also been dragged to court. Now, none of this is going well for Bomai. And we don't know if he has any plans, you know, that he will come up in the next few months. But so far, it has been very, very weak. Now, Bangalore has 24 uh, assembly, assembly seats. We are 28. 28. Now, uh, we are talking about an assembly of 224 seats. Correct. So, Brand Bengaluru might have taken a hit, but then again, you see uh, your Masuru MP, for instance, Pratap Simma. I see him showcasing this Grand Bangalore to Masuru Highway expressway, in fact, which will cut down the travel cost by half from three hours to one and a half hours. Correct. That is also there to be showcased, and there must be many other things happening in other parts of Karnataka. So, we can't really judge this entire governance model uh, on what is happening in Bangalore, but yes. Bangalore has been hitting the headlines for all the wrong reasons. Just to add to that, uh, the BJP can't hide much in Bangalore because uh, since 2010, the local, the Bangalore Corporation has been run by the BJP. Mm -hmm. So they don't have much place to hide there. And they've also not conducted an election for the BBMP, which was last with an elected council in September 2020. So two years, they've not been able to do that also, fearing what we've been told is fearing that, you know, how this could affect, you know, the assembly elections if it doesn't go their way. So they don't have much to hide there as well. Let me take another question from one of our viewers. Uh, Priyank Upadhyay, will this caste politics help BJP garner all Lingayat votes, especially when Yadrapa and Bombay are not getting along with each other and BJP being a mess in Karnataka? Well, can the BJP still garner Lingayat votes? So before I... Toss it up to Sharan to answer. Let me remind you. Uh, the question is, where will the Gaiats go? Now, from, since 1990, when the community had this heartbreak with the Congress after the Virinda Patil incident, when Rajiv Gandhi had actually sacked him when he was not well, yeah. when he was bedridden, that break has not, I don't know how much uh, recovery the party has been able to make uh, so far, but the BJP has been dominant and Lingayats have not really shown that inclination to come back to the Congress in a big way, although Lingayats do have their leaders from congressmen also. But I suppose uh, Lingayats, what, 15, 20%, 25% of them vote for the Congress? What do you say, Shadan? Uh, yes, it's it's very specific to constituencies. There are many, many constituencies where the Lingayats do support, uh, you know, the BJP. Uh, but en masse, Yes, they have voted en masse in the past. And that en masse support that you're, you're referring to, that the BJP actually enjoys, a large part of it is because of Yedi Europa. I mean, yeah. you have to remember that in 2007, when he was given, you know, when he was sacked as a chief minister, just, you know, just a week after he took over from the coalition partner, H.T. Kumar Swami, uh, the Lingayats backed him. They saw it as a betrayal from another dominant community member to their own. And they backed him en masse and they helped him come to get 110 seats out of the 224. It was still not a majority, by the way. The BJP has never won a full majority on its own in Karnataka so far. So where will the Lingayats go? The Lingayats have their options. It's not like they're out of options. And in Karnataka, this case is very much in, you know, this, this question is very much relevant because they may vote together for the BJP in the Lok Sabha elections, but in the assembly elections, they will look out for their own. And they vote for several people in the Congress who are also, you know, very important Lingayat leaders. And all of this plays perfectly into the court of Yadurappa, who is a person who has so far had caste-based politics as his base. As opposed to Bombay, who's trying to juggle between this entire Hindutva, caste, and many other things. He has not been able to get any support. He's not by any measure considered, uh, a, you know, a leader of the community. So where will the Lingayats go? They have their options. But whether the Lingayats will go or not is a thing we'll have to see whether Bombay can or the BJP can manage their expectations. And they will have to rely very heavily on Yadirappa if they want the Lingayats support intact.
What do you think Yadurappa is going to do? Yadurappa has always been about him getting the power and now he wants to placate his children. His second son was not given an MLC seat. Now he's hoping that his second son will get an MLA ticket. And however that goes, he wants to see that happen. Now, whether the BJP wants that second son, because that second son is also mired in controversy. Now, he's had his share of problems. There are enough BJP leaders who have problems with him. So we don't know whether that will, you know, whether Yadurapa will be satisfied. And also to see all of his power drained away from him. Uh, now, these is, are, uh, another son is an MP. And other son is an MP. And, yes. and as we know, there could be a cabinet reshuffle in Delhi. I mean, Prime Minister Modi may carry out a cabinet reshuffle uh, maybe in the next one week, two weeks. Yes. That's, that's what we're expecting. If something happens there, Okay. Will that placate Yadurappa? Uh, I don't think that will placate Yadurappa because Yadurappa, <clears throat> at the moment at least, has uh, he's not been getting the importance that he deserve, He thinks he deserves. Uh, in fact, even for yesterday's uh, Prime Minister Modi's event, the National Youth Festival in Hubali, uh, Yadurappa was not an invitee for that and several other programs. So uh, Yadurappa is not being seen everywhere that Goma is. And uh, I don't think any of this has really helped much. But uh, in the next few months, how they treat him will really, really matter. Because Yadirappa, like several other leaders like Deve Gauda and Sidra Maya, are very good at local coalition building that has kept them relevant in Karnataka's politics all for the last two to three decades. Mm. Now that... Yes, please. Sorry? Please go ahead. Yeah, so they, I mean, he's one of those local coalition builders. He enjoys a great rapport with Sidramaya. He enjoys a great rapport with Deve Gauda and several other leaders. Now, the same cannot be said about other BJP leaders. Now, who is to replace uh, Yadirapa? When that question came up, nobody really had answers. Everyone put themselves forward, but nobody saw uh, anyone other than Yadirapa in that particular place. That is also the way that he and his politics moved, evolved. Uh, Bomai was a choice that the high command made. It was not necessary just here in Europe. And there is no real second rung leadership. Even now, if you ask me who can replace Bomai, the answer, I mean, it could be anybody right now. We don't have any specific answers uh, because you'll have to consider caste, whether Yadirapa agrees, whether the high, com high command approves. So there are many, many, you know, uncertainties there. And Yadurappa will be pleased only if he has it his way, as we've seen him in the past. If he has it his way, or then he moves away entirely, which again doesn't help the BJP. How much will Hindutva impact elections? Even the last assembly election I was there, traveling around, we heard BJP leaders mm -hmm. talking about these polarizing issues only. Mm -hmm. But then they fell short. Given what has happened now, and in the past few months on the Bombay, can Hindutva make up for all the losses or the ground lost? Uh, Hindutva, I mean, they probably, they have, they won most of the seats in the coastal belt, which is where Hindutva actually does work. In other places, okay, you can mobilize crowds, but will that crowd vote on the basis of Hindutva? It's very uncertain. They're trying to experiment it in other places. Hasn't worked so far. It works very well in the coastal regions where they're now trying to get the two seats that the Congress has out of the 21 in those three districts. Uh, but otherwise, Hindutva has uh, has limited political capital, especially since we're talking about the bigger the bigger base in Karnataka, which is caste. Most people, it's a very caste-based political in society here. So uh, Hindutva has a big role to play when it comes to mobilizing crowds. Uh, but not necessarily when it comes to voting. So, and BJP leaders themselves too, in, in several constituencies, know that they have to depend on the vote of minorities. So they do not go this line. So this is a line meant for people like the Pratap Simhas of the world or the Shobha Karanlajes and the uh, Anand Kumar Hegedes who can get away with this because they are part of those constituencies. But not everyone follow this. Not everyone can identify this. And as experts have told us, maintaining hate with your neighbors is a very tedious process. So they have to see them every day. And, you know, to maintain this Hindutva on one side and then 
trying to isolate minorities. It's not good for business. It's not good for their own neighborhoods. So it's a very strenuous process. So it works in a few places, but not everywhere in Karnataka. And uh, I don't, I, I, I'm not so sure on if there are other parts of Karnataka which will vote en masse because of Hindutva. And uh, in other parts of Karnataka, you also have to know that the Hindutva line won't work because uh, Congress and the JDS or any other parties will again go back to the caste, caste politics part of it. And then again, they will, you know, even Yatnar, that is Basangod Yatnar, who's a person who's a very firebrand sort of a leader who speaks about Hindutva and then, you know, uh, talks about, uh, you know, isolating minorities. Even he is spearheading the Panchamasali movement. You know, as much as he'd like to speak about Hindutva, he cannot alienate his subcaste and his caste. So that is how important that is. Thank you very much, Sharan, for giving us a great insight into Karnataka politics and thank you viewers. Thank you.